Uh, so yeah, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tyrone, um, and I have been given the privilege to speak on the second half of 2 Timothy 2, uh, which talks about dealing with false teachers. Ooh. And so I'm sure that at some point in our lives, we've, we've gotten into an argument with someone who believes that they are 100% right in an argument, but you know that they are 100% wrong. <laughs> like usually when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm in those type of arguments, I just like stare at the person and I just, just give them this look over like, okay. Okay. But in my mind, I'm just thinking to myself, like, I cannot wait for you to finish that sentence so I can finish you off. <laughs> and it's one of the best feelings ever. It's, it's definitely one of the greatest feelings to, to know that you are right while the other person is, is oh wrong gosh. and they are convinced that they are right. Amen. And, you know, it reminds me of this past Sunday. Uh, before church, I actually left my umbrella over at the sister's household and I sent out a little text. I was like, hey guys, can you please uh, just get my umbrella for me? I have the green and black one. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so suddenly about five, ten minutes later, I, I get a message from Ashley going, hey bro, these are the only umbrellas that we've got. I said, yeah, it's the, it's the black and green one in that picture right there. She sent a picture to me and she goes, bro, it's blue and gray. And I was like, no, it's, it's, I'm sorry, black and gray. It, and I go, no, it's black and green. And then she's like, no, it's black and gray. And I was like, mate, it is black and green. And she goes, mate, it is black and gray. <laughs> and so I just said, all right, fine, whatever, sure. Just the one on the left, please give that, uh, give it to me. <laughs> so she comes over to church. I look at it and I was like, that mess is black and gray. <laughs> <laughs> and to make it, to make matters worse, uh, Ashley goes off to the side and she goes, Medani, what color does this look to you? <laughs> and I was like, okay, I get it. You win. I lost. I'm sorry. Amen. And it was it was interesting because, you know, Ashley, when, when she confronted me on this, she had full confidence uh, knowing that my umbrella was black and gray. But my question to you tonight is, how confident are you when it comes to dealing with false teachers? Ooh. And so tonight, guys, we need to understand that when it comes to false teachers, I know our, our first instinct is to think of those who are outside of the church, but sometimes we can also have false teachers inside the church without even knowing it. Ooh. And so tonight, we're going to be learning how to deal with false teachers. And so my first point, in order for us to learn how to deal with false teachers, our first, our first point is we need to learn how to deal with godless talk. Mm -hmm. So in 2 Timothy, um, this letter was written around 60 to 6, I'm sorry, 66 to 67 AD when Paul was in, pre, uh, in prison for preaching in Rome. Now at this time, Paul knew that his life was coming to an end pretty soon and persecution was starting to grow against the Christians. Um, just like Chris had mentioned in his sermon last Sunday, that there was an event where Emperor Nero was, was burning uh, Christians alive just to light up his garden. Um, now, <clears throat> sorry, I just lost my place right here. Okay, so now he's now writing to Timothy uh, some of his last instructions. In 2 Timothy 2, 14 and 15, it says, Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth. So right here, Paul is talking about quarreling about words. Now you can imagine from Paul's perspective, while he's locked away in a dungeon and he's writing a letter, you can, you can imagine he's thinking to himself, like, this is the last thing that the church needs. Uh, just a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of Christians quarreling with each other over words while we're also receiving persecution. But he says two things about quarreling over words. One, it is of no value. Two, it ruins those who listen. And when you think of it from a general perspective, when, when, when you're in a group setting and two people get into an argument with each other, mm. everyone who's not really involved in the argument, who are just listening, it really does kind of, you know, bring the mood down. Yeah. You know, if you imagine mom and dad arguing, um, when, they, when they get into an argument, you don't know what to do. You just kind of sit there and just go, okay, like, so what do we do from here? I'm pretty sure Isabel can relate. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but anyway, for those, but, but I have a question for those of us who are part of the, uh, the original mission team to, to Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, when it, are you mindful of others and how you talk to one another, especially in front of the younger Christians? Because I know that at times that when we're together in a group setting, it's very tempting for us to, to want to get our thoughts across to, uh, to the other person and even make sure that many people around us even hear what we have to say. But my challenge is to you, next time you feel tempted to respond to a comment from another brother or a sister, you gotta ask yourself, is this gonna bring somebody down? Mm -hmm. But we need to understand that quarrelsome words can and will bring people down, and there is no use for it. Continuing on in verse 16, it says, Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. 
Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. And uh, what's interesting right here, I looked at the words godless and ungodly and I was thinking to myself, are, are they different? And so I did a little bit of research and I saw that with godless, it, it's defined as not acknowledging any deity or God without belief in any deity or God. And ungodly means lacking reverence for God. So if you were to take those definitions and you put them into the scripture, Basically, it means that the more you indulge in atheistic conversations, the more you start to lack reverence for God. Wow. Go figure. You know, you start talking, uh, talking like an atheist, of course you're going to start lacking reverence for God. Yeah. But uh, in verse 17, it says, their teaching will spread like gangrene. Who here is very familiar with uh, gangrene? Yeah, just a few of us, right? <clears throat> So with gangrene, uh, it, it's an infection, basically, and it's an infection that can spread fast. In fact, I actually had gangrene at, at one point in my life. Uh, I was riding my bike to school one day, and then I fell down, and I scraped my, uh, my elbow um, on train tracks. And so there's like a whole bunch of dirt and everything. And I, did, and I thought I cleaned it well enough until one day um, I, I put, a, I put a, a gauze pad over it. And then about a couple days later, I just kind of removed it because, you know, as a kid, you kind of want to see what it looks like. Um, so I did that, and then suddenly I'm like... Mom, what is this green goo? What is that? And then, uh, and she starts freaking out. She's like, oh my gosh, what is that? I'm like, I don't know. And, and I'm trying to clean it. And I'm like, it's oozing out for some reason. I'm so confused. What's going on? And um, my mom takes me to the doctor straight away. And then immediately I start getting medication and everything. They say, you need to clean it. You need to take these antibiotics. And it was, it, and it was, I was thinking to myself, it's not that serious. It's just goo. That's all. <laughs> But, with, but, I, but I read a little bit about uh, gangrene, and if it's not treated quickly enough, it can lead to death. Wow. Like gangrene, if godless chatter is not dealt with quickly enough, it will spiritually kill many in the church. Wow. Even take, uh, for example, of uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus. They, these guys, they started their own teachings, causing many people to lose their faith. Mm -hmm. um, they started creating a, a doctrine that was based off of their own knowledge. It was called Gnosticism. Uh, it was known for being a heretic teaching in Christianity. And uh, these were the guys who, who started uh, this, um, this teaching within the church. So the, what we can take from this is that there will be people in the church um, who will try pulling people away from the truth. Mm -hmm. And so for us, the best way that we can deal with it is that we need to know, we need to understand, and we need to teach the scriptures in order to not fall for uh, false teachings. Not just simply having good arguments. Um, we, we need to be able to start, and uh, we need to learn our Bibles well enough to actually present the truth versus just simply arguing for the sake of arguing. True. Um, an example that I think of is Pascal. Um, I, I, still, I, I still hear the story several times about, you know, how, um, how one of his friends was, uh, was texting him and, um, and he was texting him all these things, you know, like uh, being a Christian is really hard. And Pascal just kept responding with scriptures. Scripture after scripture, Come on, Callie. and it really shows how awesome. much he he doesn't I mean, he he knows his Bible, he understands it, yeah. and he's teaching the scriptures. Mm -hmm. He's not just simply arguing or coming up with with good points to try to prove the other person wrong. Mm -hmm. So my challenge to you guys, when it comes to uh, dealing with godless chatter or dealing with false teachers, you gotta understand your Bible. Yeah. You gotta know your convictions. Mm -hmm. The best way how you can do it practically, um, I don't have it in the notes here, but I would say for one, go through the first principles. Uh, kind of like what, uh, what Douglas was saying when he was going through the cross study. Sometimes you got to take yourself through the, the first principles in yeah. order for you to, re to relearn your convictions, to, to relearn uh, the reasons why you believe in the things that you believe in. Um, and then uh, secondly, I forgot the second one. It'll come back to me later. Uh, but just we need, to, we need to constantly get into our Bibles, guys. Yeah, come All on. All right, so moving on to point number two. <clears throat> we need to learn how to deal with our own hearts when it comes mm -hmm. to dealing with false teachers. 2 Timothy 2, 19 and 21, it says, Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. In a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes, and some are for common use. Excuse me. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. So at this point, Paul is now calling Timothy to cleanse himself. And the, and the reason why is so that God can use Timothy for his special purpose. In verse 19, that's why he says, Everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. In other words, that, that's his way of cleansing himself. And what we can take from this is that the moment we turn away from wickedness is when we are made holy, we start to become useful for God, and we start to become prepared to uh, do any good work. 
My question to you tonight is, how prepared are you to do any good work for God? If you do not feel prepared, then how has it been going with turning away from wickedness? Mm. So the, my call to you guys tonight is to make the decision to turn away from wickedness as it's the first step to being made holy, useful for God, and prepared to do any good work. Mm. Continuing on in verse 22 to 24, it says, Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. So we need to chase after righteousness, faith, love, and peace while our evil desires are chasing us. That's why. Um, so the reason why <clears throat> we are actually fleeing from evil desires, I mean, obviously we want to avoid them, but the thing is, is that we think that when we are pursuing righteousness, our evil desires stop following us. Mm -hmm. But in reality, it's actually your evil desires are in constant pursuit of you while you are in constant pursuit of righteousness. Because the moment you start to slow down, that's when the evil desires start to creep up back on you. So, one of the evil desires of youth is getting into foolish and stupid arguments from verse 23. Why? Because we value our thoughts and opinions more than anyone else's and feel the need to speak out. And what we need to understand is that as, as a church, as disciples, we're, we're very different. So if we're very different, we're, we're going to have different opinions. And we need to be okay with the fact um, that someone may have, a, I might have a different um, opinion than you. That's why in 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about different parts of the body. Um, there's, if there's different parts of the body, there's going to be different ideas in God's kingdom. Now, my challenge to you from this is be open to other people's perspectives and opinions, but do not compromise what is truth from the Bible. Because mm -hmm. it's very easy for us sometimes to, to be open to hearing other people's opinions, but when it comes to, to doctrine, we, we have to be able to draw that line uh, between us. We can't just accept something uh, when, when it interferes with, uh, with the truth. <clears throat> Closing out in uh, verses 25 to 26, it says, Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. So, when dealing with false teachers, we see right here that they must be dealt with gently. So, if we, if we, help some, if we deal with someone gently, they're more likely to come to their senses and come to the knowledge of the truth. And um, even for myself at work, I'm using uh, using my, my daily life as an example. Um, Come on. I deal with people who uh, who are rich, um, and when they don't get paid, they are not happy. Uh, and so when as soon as I pick up a phone call, I'm I already have someone yelling at me, and they are just telling me off, and I have nothing to do with what's going on. Um, so what I have to do, I have to maintain my composure, I have to remain calm, and I have to you know acknowledge everything that they're saying. And then I have to just, you know, hear them out a little bit more and then just basically come up with a solution uh, for them. And then by the end of the phone call, they actually relax a little bit and they feel they feel so much better. And we're able to, you know, work through things together. But notice that my response is, is a very, you know, gentle, calm uh, type of approach. Mm -hmm. It's not an aggressive type of approach. Because when it comes to it, I, when, it, when, it, when you are dealing with an aggressive person, you never want to get aggressive back at them. Right. Because when you're aggressive with someone, it's only going to strengthen their defenses. Yeah. Um, it's not going to help anybody. It's not going to um, help them see your point. It's just going to make them even more defensive towards you. Come on, Tyrone. <clears throat> so we need to understand that when it comes to speaking aggressively with others, it's not the same as speaking authoritatively. Uh, we can sometimes uh, equate aggressiveness with, with authority, and it's not exactly the same. And we need to, we have to be able to figure out what is the difference between the two. So, in conclusion, when dealing with false teachers in and out of the church, we need to, one, learn how to deal with godless chatter by avoiding quarrels and study our Bibles to know how to combat false doctrine. And two, learn how to deal with our own hearts by pursuing righteousness making ourselves holy so that we can learn how to effectively deal with false teachers, not just arguing. And that is a lesson. Amen. Wow.